Hello, Legionnaires, and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. Tonight, our panel of Dungeon Masters, Game Masters, Referees, Storytellers, and Players will share their diverse tabletop role-playing game experiences to provide ideas, suggestions, and possibly even some advice for your tabletop RPG sessions. Let's get started. All right, welcome to some Rando RPG live stream. I am John Max Liao your host, and I'm truly grateful that you are with us for tonight's live stream discussion on <gasps> how to. I wrote down Ripple Play. That's awesome. How to Ripple Play Humans, Demi Humans, Monsters, and Aliens. How to Role Play Humans, Demi Humans, Monsters, and Aliens. And I sincerely hope you enjoy the Ripple Play conversation. So, what do we do here on some random RPG live stream? Well, in segments one through four, we discuss topics surrounding the tabletop role-playing game hobby with an emphasis on individual experiences, desires, and expectations. In tonight's four segments on how to role-play humans, demo-humans, monsters, and aliens, we hope to provide you ideas, suggestions, and food for thought for your tabletop RPG sessions. And in segment five, for those who hang around for it, we let down our hair and just talk about nerd issues of interest. And if we meet the giveaway threshold, Segment five is when that will happen. All right. So please can. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. Uh, please consider supporting Legion Myth through the links in the live streams description. YouTube takes 30%. Twitch takes 50% of your hard earned money. While Rumble, PayPal, Streamlabs, and Ko-Fi take between zero and 5%. Rumble rants and super chats of less than $20. I will read at the end of the segment. Actually, it's in between questions. I should say at the end of the question. Uh, $20 or more. I will interrupt. To read your rant or chat as immediately as I can, and $50 or more, which has actually happened the last couple of times, and I'm not prepared again, I will take a drink in your name, and you can force the panel to answer one gaming-related question of your choice. Now, if we make $100 or more in Super Chats or Rumble and Rumble Rants, there will be a, I think it's $100, it's been a while, yeah, it's $100, $100 Palladium Books or drive through RPG gift card giveaway during Segment 5 towards the end of the live stream. Legion of Myth YouTube members, as well as tonight's Super Chatters, Rumble Ranters, have the opportunity to win, but you must be watching to claim your victory. Else it rolls over to next week. Actually, I'm capping it at 100 bucks, so it won't roll over next week, so you may as well win today. Just do it, all right? So don't forget, Legion of Myth moderators will time out or even ban people who attack any panelist or chatter. Attack the argument, not the person, and keep your various social media beefs off my channel. Or off my show. I don't care about the channel. Come back for that later. And of course, please like this video. Subscribe to all the panelists' channels found in the description. They're already there, sort of. They probably didn't do the little YouTube highlight thing, but it is what it is. They're all there. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and support. All right. Now, with that all out of the way, let's get started. So... We've got four fine guests today. We hope the Crafting Gamer's alive. We're not sure. We haven't had a chance to talk to him yet, but we'll, we'll hopefully uh, inter he'll introduce himself in a moment here. Uh, also, uh, we're noting that there are some StreamYard troubles, and we know it's on the StreamYard side, or we believe it's on the StreamYard side, unless the entire internet on whatever coast everybody lives on is going down, because I'll freeze for one person, but not for everybody. Heathen Dog will freeze for one person, not for everybody. <laughs> Timothy Frelly will freeze for one person, but not for everybody. So there's some weird things happening here. If you see that on your end, go send StreamYard, the horrible, horrible company, the StreamYard that's going to over double. That's right. It's raising costs by over double for the same features. Uh, let them know your displeasure. Now, that out of the way, let's start with uh, Heathen Dog. Who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Okay. Um, I'm Brett. How you doing? I'm a co-host on the uh, um, RPG Digest, and I talk about uh, uh, tabletop role-playing games, uh, do overviews on many. Uh, some I played, some I haven't. Uh, the last couple years, it's been more than half Palladium, because Palladium's <laughs> got a lot of books, and that's a lot of content. <laughs> Gets a lot of views, too. Gets <laughs> a lot of views. I've been uh, role-playing since I was eight, game mastering since I was 12 or 13, and I'm 48 now. Um. Yeah, that's that's pretty much uh pretty much what I do. Uh, I I'm uh, I'm on YouTube just like many other YouTubers. I'm here as a professional opinion guy. That's that's what I do. I literally get paid to tell people what I think. Not a lot. Yeah, whoever your boss is needs to. I know, right? I mean, raid to do. <laughs> raid Shadow Legends could really could really pay me enough, but some asshole won't let me do that. 
I know, right? Well, when they approach you, let me know. <laughs> then uh, below him, uh, back for the second time in a row, uh, Timothy Ferrelli, who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Uh, my name is Timothy Ferrelli. I run Characters of Ice, where we make characters so you don't have to. I pr primarily focus on the Palladium side, um, working on Palladium fantasy characters to help guide you along and teach you how it's done and give you ideas. I am not a professional YouTube commentator, opinion maker, because I don't get paid by YouTube. Uh, still in the YouTube black hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm too. I'm still too young, um, and I've been gaming for thirty odd years, uh, from AD and D to Palladium to fifth ed, fifth ed, fourth um, fourth ed once, and that was garbage. Third ed, um, you no. Know, um, LARPing, all kinds of stuff. So I'm diverse in, in role-playing and what it takes and how to do it. All right. And back with us again is The Crafting Gamer. How are you today, sir? As always, who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? I am The Crafting Gamer. I have... I'm probably going to get back into it because I got a new computer. That's the reason why I wasn't backstage earlier because... <laughs> Apparently, you know, your new computer does not like StreamYard at all. Oof. And uh, my tabletop experience is I got to spend about 10 years jamming for a bunch of little groups, what I call mini campaigns, and playing for and jamming for a, one big group. And my experience is primarily teenage murder hobos. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, um, one of the reasons I asked that question for folks, I don't do it to show off like, oh, well, somebody's got so much more experience than somebody else, yada, yada. It's to actually show that we have a panel of sometimes, sometimes not, uh, diverse people that, you know, some people are brand new to the hobby. Some people have been doing this for a long time. Some people like a certain type of game. Some people make a lot of stuff. Other people don't make anything. So it just kind of shows that we have people of, uh, of different talents and different expectations here. So that's why I asked that. It's not not to belittle anybody, as a commenter uh, made a couple weeks ago. No, not at all. So, all right, let's uh, start with our first question for tonight. We will start with Heathen Dog on this one, because our topic is about role-playing humans, demi-humans, humanoids, and aliens. And right off the bat, we are going to start with Heathen Dog's favorite subject, human supremacy. No, it's embracing human diversity. So, Heathen Dog... Since humans are boring and we're all the same and there's nothing different about us, how do you make human characters distinct and memorable in a fantasy setting? Well, it, it doesn't really matter what game you're playing. Built into the original version of, of every game you've probably ever played, unless it was developed in the last 10 years, each race looks at the world differently. Each race is biologically different different from each other and the cool thing about humans is that they can live almost anywhere elves love the woods humans can live in the woods dwarves love mountains and underground well humans can do that too you know and uh what is the uh, not not a hobbit but uh halflings love you know hobbit hobbit crap well humans like that crap too. so they're they're biologically the diverse you can find them anywhere and because of that, their mindset is also just as diverse, where all the other races have a certain worldview. A human can change his worldview depending on the situation. If you live in the mountains, you will think like, I'm a dude who lives in the mountains. An elf can't do that. A halfling can't do that. Just can't. A, a dwarf would probably like that, but... That, that's that's where they that's where they normally live. So uh, uh, I I have humans being uh, not just uh, diverse in the ecosystems where they can they can survive almost anywhere, but they can fit in almost anywhere because they have the exact same diverse mindset. So when when I am playing or running a game, that's how I make humans stand out. I make them stand out by making them everywhere. Not like everywhere is in crowding everyone's style, but there's going to be a small village of humanity here. There's going to be a small village of humanity there. And they're going to be different types of humans because of where they live. If a human lives in a swamp, 
he's going to be a Creole swamp swamp dude. If <laughs> if if a human lives in the fields, he's going to be a, a, a Native American, you know, nomad wanderer type guy because they adapt to their environment. Whereas other races, they're more biologically rigid. Both okay. have their place, but a human's place can be anywhere. That's that's how I go about it. All right. So how do you approach role playing different human cultures or societies or villages within the same game world? How, how do you make them distinct from each other? Well, the different human cultures really depends on the game master and the world that he created. You know, if if uh, if the game master says, OK, we're going to stay in this country, then there's not going to be a whole, a whole bunch of cultural differences in humans. But if you're traveling over an entire continent, over a world, or or even, you know, solar systems or universes, whatever, then you are going to find humans. They're going to be biologically the same as the humans you know, but they're going to have a different culture, which means they're going to have different skill sets. They're going to have different, slightly different attitudes, stuff like that. So, again, it depends on where they live. I base human culture on where humans are physically residing. Just, just like I said before, but the whole, you know, a swamp human, I, I would probably default to the whole Creole thing. Uh, a plains human, a, a woods human, a mountain human culture is going to be different, adapted to the environment. So that's going to be the different types of humans you're going to find. Physically, they're going to be exactly the same, but culturally, they're, they're going to be more aligned, kind of like the the demi-humans who, who, uh, who are born and bred for that environment. You know, a, 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 a culturally, a, a human who lives in the woods is going to be more culturally elf than than a normal than a human who lives in the plains. Well, it's kind of like real world Tibetan monks, right? You know, yeah. Lung capacity and all right, that nonsense. Right. That they, yeah. yeah. Uh, crafting gamer, just so you know, whatever change you made, there's something echoing in your microphone. Oh, right. Um. All right, well, uh, let's move on to use the same question uh, for uh, Timothy Frehley here. Uh, how do you make human characters distinct and memorable in a fantasy setting? Much like he and the dog play into the different social differences between the religions. Don't be afraid of using real-world examples. A great example of this is from Gen X Bear's fantasy game that, you're, that uh, you, you are a member of and he plays. You had different real world examples of factions in there, a very religious Catholic faction, an Arabian like faction. Um, you had gypsies. There the the diversity is there for for humans to be culturally different in the different regions. So uh, that's yeah, you make it memorable by making them culturally different. Okay, so how do you ensure that human characters and this can be NPCs or PCs, remain engaging. Because you use Bear as an example, and his human characters are are very engaging. How do you, how do you uh, ensure that they remain engaging and dynamic throughout the campaign? And for NPCs, it's upon the GM. You've got to put that effort in there to possibly use different inflections, to try to use different tones, try to use uh, different words. For example, uh, maybe making a halfling with the slight... British accent, um, it's like, oi, you bark, you know, barkeep, you know, try, you gotta, you gotta put that in, put that effort in to uh, make that a memorable encounter or make memorable interactions. Okay. Uh, I have to wait for Crafting Gamer to come back. So, you know what? I have an extra follow-up ready to go. So, you know what? I'll just give this to both of you guys. You both can jump in. Uh, I'll use this one. How do you balance realism and creativity when developing human characters? Realism and creativity. Well, realism in a role-playing game is subjective to what the game master created in the world. You know, well, well, realism real, for realism the game is whatever fits in the world. Well, I, I guess in this instance, real, realism is the fact that, hey, um, almost like what you said, all the dock workers act a certain way. They do something else work or they, they act a certain way. The stereotype, I guess we'll just say stereotypes. It's very stereotypical. Sure. Basically, you know, Hey there, I'm from Minnesota. And yes, when I grew up, most of the people talk like this, um, 
Don't and you know? Then, but but yeah, don't you know? Oofta. Uh, but on the on the flip side, the creativity side of it is you know I hate to say it this way, but it's the uh, against type thinking outside the box, adding color to the character. Yeah, you know it's the more imaginative side. So how do you realism? I guess was not a good word for me to use. How how do you translate the bioessentialism or the expectation with I got to be me? You want to take this one first? Um, if it's the when you're when you're dealing with the region dynamics of or the uh, what is made what makes that region that humans from specific uh unique uh you got to learn to incorporate that with what is actually going on a british halfling going into an area of japanese elves for example and, and that's going to come up later but um you, you okay yeah <laughs> um so you've got to uh it's really it's to keep true to what makes your character unique uh is if you're playing off of a real world example keep that um accent going keep the mentality going and you just gotta incorporate that with you know what's going on about when you're fighting a bugbear fighting uh godzilla or whatnot okay he and Doug, did you want to f- respond or? No, that's great. Okay. All right, uh, crafting gamer, just do me a favor. Uh, we're on to you now, so yep. you're good. But when uh, you're not actively talking, please mute because there's still that sound in the background. Uh, but <sighs> feel free to it's jump in. Probably my you... fan or my heater. Okay. Fan and heater. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So the I'm question the is, around, uh, how how do you make human characters distinct and memorable in a fantasy setting? Well, Heathen Dog said it pretty well to begin with. He, you got to base it primarily off a of location, but you also have to base it off of, of what's in their environment. Excellent example. It's it's a Warhammer fantasy, but it's an excellent example. When orcs took over a particular planet, they let certain human tribes survive because the humans quickly adopted might makes right and build out of scrap, and the orcs respected that. So the humans survived by emulating a orcish culture. But another example that I used in one of my games is I gave humans a, uh, come to find out, Palladium already had a, probably a better version. I hadn't read it. A seafaring culture that lived in the big sea of the Palladium fantasy realm. And they were entirely, they lived entirely on boats and things like that. And they they took after, I would say, more of a mythological mer people because they even could, I had given the ability to not breathe underwater, but hold their breath for almost three times as long as a normal human. So they just, I made it so they adapted their environment. Water was not just a big part of their life. It was almost everything. Wood was more valuable than gold because you needed it to build ships. And their entire culture was based off of the, 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 the uh, currents of the sea. So they were also very laid back people. Whatever came their way, they just weathered it like a storm of the sea. Okay. Uh, what cultural or societal influences do you incorporate to your human characters and why? Ooh, that, it depends on where I'm putting it, because especially if I'm uh, putting a warlike setting, I'm very likely to add some Roman-like features. Because, well, Rom- Romans are great for war, and especially if the players start getting involved. You want something that can actually do tactics, otherwise you're just going to have uh, the uh, interdimensional portal put into a great into a uh, portable hole <laughs> disaster that Bruce had. Okay. I mean, no, I mean, that's a, that's a good example. I mean, uh, I mean, that is a cultural and a societal influence. So, and I guess that's why anything else. Okay. <laughs> can we I got go one. On? I got one. Yeah. I'm quite fond well, of putting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just right. one second. No, no. Is it still your time crafting gamers? If you got one more, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I'm quite fond of adding a Norse, Norse uh, influences, especially for mountain people. Uh, I was heavy into Greek as a teenager, but as an, I've, I've been playing more, Norse seems to be more interesting. So I try to incorporate that with a kind of a Roman feel, you know, try to imagine barbarians with an actually halfway decent organized army. Okay. And so with that, we are actually at the open portion. Now, if you guys want to do any crosstalk, ask each other any questions, so on and so forth. Heathen Dog, you said you had well, something you wanted yeah, to add to Yeah, I, I actually thought of something. Uh, mm-hmm. It it's a it's part and parcel to the uh, to the idea that humans are more open-minded and and uh, uh, 
I don't want changeable is not, not the right, adaptable uh, than than demi human races. And one of those things is alignment. If if a game has an alignment system, usually because the the demi humans are so rigid in their mindset, they tend to gravitate toward a similar alignment or a similar mm -hmm. kind of alignment. Whereas humans, they run the gamut from you know from uh, lawful good to chaotic evil there there's humans in a single society there will be every single alignment possible now a demi human would look at this and say oh this must be pure chaos that's crazy i mean most of people don't think the same they have they have they have different ideas about everything you know you you show 10 humans a balloon one of them's going to say it's a boat yeah how just does he just acting like that is weird yeah it's weird right but it works for humans because we we can roll with almost anything. And sometimes having a lawful evil leader of a society makes the society better. Sometimes it works. Neutral evil works too. They're sticklers hmm. for the law. You know, that's what it is. So, you know, the, that that also is is uh is is something that that makes humans special better than than all all of those demi humans. The reason they're called demi humans, they're less than human. Oh, half a human. He went with the demo. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's not an accident. It's not an accident. So uh yeah, I mean uh that that as well uh creates the 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 full range of human diversity, which which makes them special and it makes up for all the other advantages demi humans get. Uh either magic resistance or stat bonuses or long life or whatever. You know, magic resistance, whatever. It makes up for that because you can't get rid of them because they're everywhere. But heathen dog, I mean, even even humans have to make something uh, to be pleasing. I mean, coalition states got the best of boys, the dog boys. They're you could consider them demi humans, and you know the, the coalition states had to make them to make their lives better. Well, I don't you, know if I don't know if it, they're so dogs, I, man. I mean, they're man's best friend. The only the only yeah. reason that 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 they're given a leg up in uh, in in coalition society is because they're dogs. <laughs> we love dogs. We since, since also, like for yeah. tens of thousands of years, humans have been have been training dogs to love us. This is just the dog boys are dog the boys culmination. Are also, sorry, that's okay. The cu culmination of that sentiment. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're gonna treat him special. <laughs> Go ahead, crafting. Dog boys are one of the most versatile demi races there are. That, that they don't is get as many choices true. as I humans, mean, but they get a lot of choices. They yeah, I don't know if they would be considered a demi race. Rifts well, is I mean the, 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 the technical he even word is palladium. uplifted. <laughs> well, right, but but even using palladium. Yeah. You do have actual demi humans. You have the ogres, the orcs, the kobolds, elves, dwarves, you know, yada yada. I know those don't directly translate to rifts. I don't know if rifts actually has demi humans in that well, form. I, this, like, this, 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 this is what this this is what I consider a demi human in in Palladium. Now, does this work one hundred percent? No, but it it fits most holes. If it's an RCC, it's a I consider it a demi human race. If it's an OCC, then eh, whatever. It is, it is not a, a specific demi-human thing. But it's a racial character class, means humans can't take it. That means it's a demi-human deal. And dog See, boys... I, I, would, if, I would look if, at like dragons as more monsters. But Dragon, you know, is a... Well, it used to be anyway. It's just a straight-up RCC. Now, you could say, well, what about bursters? Bursters are human. Eh, fair enough. Yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, but my idea about it does doesn't work there. Hey, you know what? It, there's exceptions to every rule. All right. Yeah, but that's a psychic <laughs> race to begin with. But back to the dog boys being uh, versatile, I disagree with you because they have their each individual breed is focused on some aspect. For uh, for example, bloodhounds, um, and even the most recent um, call it, um, that British dog that the Queen liked um, that that actually likes fairies. Uh, it, they're they're each dog boy breed is a focused aspect and therefore much more in line with traditional demi humans. Hmm. 
So I'm going to put this on the screen now, even though we're not ready for chat yet. But I want, I want to put because it's because I didn't realize we were going to have this problem. I'm having a definitional problem right now. This might False. be true in a general context. This isn't true. And here's why. I, I, I probably should state that for the term demi-human, we're effectively using the Dungeons & Dragons version of it. It's the 800-pound gorilla. It's where the, the concept generally comes from. A demi-human is, is just one of the humanoid races that aren't the monster races. So an orc is not a, a demi-human. That's a monster race. That would be the humanoid or, or whatever. The demi-humans are literally the elf, dwarf, gnome halfling that's it isn't it <laughs> half elf i guess is technically a demi human would that be a quarter human hmm anyway uh you know as as far as that goes so that's that's the general premise that we're using which is you know now if we want to start calling a lot of things demi humans well that's going to change the rest of the show because we have an entire segment i'm just playing humanoid slash monster characters yeah, like but the, 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 the whole demi human thing is less than human and so a demi god would be less than god less than a god God well, like, demi actually less means a half. So I mean, it's technically yeah. that's it, but it's half human. <laughs> but that well, isn't. Yeah, but, but that isn't the definition, though. Isn't like, well, it's a half a human. Uh, yeah. It's just used, yeah. I got it. All right. Let's. Uh, do you guys have anything else you want to say about how to make human characters distinct and memorable in a fantasy setting? Yeah. All right. No, then I mean, I that was that was quick, but that that's good. Maybe we'll. <laughs> After the last couple that went like five hours, maybe we need a quick one here. Uh, for folks, if uh, you think you have some presence and charisma, the ability to entertain and educate a good AV setup free from noise pollution and interest in discussing tabletop RPGs in this format, join the Some Rando RPG Livestream Discord. The link is in the description to stay tuned for future topics. I've already started working on next year's topics because I try to have them prepared a couple of months out, but I have to develop questions, do a whole bunch of you know craziness with them, but it's, it's in the works. I've already got next year in the works. Uh, as far as this year goes, all the way through the end of the year, I have the topics up on that Discord. Maybe one of them will be of interest to you. So help us get to know you, and maybe we'll get you on the show to talk about your experiences as well. I uh, didn't have any super chats this time around, but there were a couple that I did want to uh, address. Actually, it was just one. Uh, yes, uh, this comment, uh, there he actually had a bunch of comments at the beginning there, but yes, there is bioessentialism bio in RPGs, and it's necessary. It's necessary bioessentialism. There's literally no point in having a halfling, an elf, a dwarf, an orc, a dragon, a dog boy, or anything, if it's nothing but a human with pointed ears or a tail or some other cosmetic nonsense. All right, Nobody cares about your cosplay. They care that you're half a demon. So, uh, so biosense, and with that, there's a reason why you have that. So there's a reason why dwarves are stubborn. I have an entire video on this, and we might get in this in the next segment. So I'm not going to take their th potential thunder away from them. But there are reason elves exist. To they are not human. Our trope is diversity. Their trope is whatever it happens to be for them in the world that they're in. So yes. Biosensualism is a thing, else you are doing it wrong. And I have no problem telling everybody from somebody who's seven foot two, eight hundred pounds, and those eight forms of martial arts, he's wrong to the little nerd out there is like, well, actually, no, you're wrong. That's just that simple. Let's move on. You're wrong. Shut up and color. Now, that said, uh, let's go on to our next uh question. So uh we're gonna move down to Timothy Ferelli to start this one out here. So what are the benefits? We're still in humans now. We're still Talking about the humans. What are the benefits of playing human characters compared to demi-humans or monsters? The Well, the benefits of being a human is the diversity the, that you can draw upon. Uh, for most, the, the fact that you can interact with every other uh, intelligent race on a polite and social level. Um, for most... For most of your interactions, you're going to have a better, um, a positive, better positive opinion of of yourself, of who you are, what you do, unless you actually just go complete murder hobo, and then you develop that um, uh, reputation. Uh, and for a lot of settings, it's you know the the variety of uh, capabilities that you're going to have available to you. Okay, so uh, actually, I want to save this one because of a particular word for heathen dogs. So, I'll, uh, what what unique challenges have you faced when role playing 
human characters and how did you overcome them? Hmm. Um, the unique challenges or big, biggest unique challenge I have is when it is a, a human world. Um, when you don't have any de uh, demi humans in there, um, trying to keep the mindset of of the fiction, uh, and you just um, hmm, the yeah, this one's really throwing me for a loop. Well, I mean, there's there's one simple one, and hopefully, I'm not taking somebody else's comment or answer away from it. But I mean, humans don't have dark vision. I mean that that I mean that is a that is a challenge that humans have. Well, yeah. Uh, again, those the solution to that is get a freaking torch. Um, oh, right, but but I mean that's the that's the point though. I mean he, by so 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 one of the one of the things that happens in a lot of games and Dungeons and Dragons, especially as time's gone on, is really seem to have pushed this, or at least there's a thought process. But why would I play a human to suck? Humans don't get anything. They don't get, they don't get any special powers. They don't get this or they don't get that or what it feats or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so humans have a set of unique challenges by being the diversity trope. True. Um, but they also, th that gets balanced out uh, in their uh, better, a lot of times better skills, uh, better um, stats. A lot of times, you know, they're, they're greater uh, selections of uh, enhancements. Uh, they and plus the ability, you know, whatever they, the if there's something specific like like the dark vision example, they can get a helmet that gives them dark vision. So uh, it's any any uh, potential that a human being vanilla is a bad thing. Really, is it's non-existent because any human can can adapt to the situations that they're in. Yeah, I, uh, that that right there, I think, can be summed up that humans do not have any inherent disadvantages. Fair. Yeah. Now you could say, well, they also have don't even inherit advantages. No, their advantage of not having disadvantage is more important. <laughs> Well, well, we'll we'll come we'll come back around. So uh, we got to go into a crafting gamer here. Crafting gamer, the question for you: Can you describe a scenario where playing a human character provided a unique solution to a problem in your game? Uh, yes. Uh, this is would be playing in Bruce's game. Uh, we uh went to a dwarven city that after a time we found out was originally founded on demons and uh well they wanted to bring those times back sorry I'm a little brain fart there so uh the we were hired by a guild to actually go and establish a trading out there trading post out there that was it we seen what was happening and agreed we're going to help these dwarves the dwarves actually got t so tired of us seeing fight their fights for them they basically said all right humans get out we need to do this ourselves we motivated dwarves as humans. And the entire group is nothing but humans. Which is funny because in the in a lot of novels, like the trope is elves and dwarves don't get along until the humans come in and I wouldn't say show them the error of their ways, but bind them together. The stubbornness right. of the dwarf and the flightiness of the elf and the humans take the charge. Where you know, I mean, it, so what you're saying there is actually fits within the the trope, the fantasy trope. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. That was the main question, right? Yeah, I didn't ask you a follow up yet. Uh, what strategies do you use to highlight the strengths and weaknesses of human characters in your campaigns? Now, uh, this is particularly on the GM side, but you can take it either way as a player or game master. I. Well, I'll take it from both because as a player, when I'm playing humans, I try to. Definitely not play against type, but I try. I, I try to be the the wanderer that's from another land if I can, so my character stands out at least a little bit from everybody else. I mean, if everybody plays that, then I'll actually play the local guy so I can still stand out from the from everybody else. Oh, we're from this land. We're from that land. I'm from this land. I'll stay. I'll be from here. That, that's how I like to play humans to be just a little bit different, not against type, just a little bit different. As a GM, I like playing. I like doing a very European style game 
where you literally go over the hill and they speak an entirely different language. Mm. So, so every human, every sound you get to is always a little bit different. It just really, really hammer home that diversity. So, so that's that's good on the, on the diversity side to show that there are many different styles of humans, so to speak. But in terms of specific strengths and weaknesses of humans, uh, again, okay. Uh, I find, I find, I mean, as a player in this instance, as a GM, it's all it can be infuriating, but. There is no real, like GM, like a, the, he and Doc said, there's no real weakness inherent with humans. I mean, yeah, humans don't get all these special abilities, but humans are also the, the creatures that can almost think their way out of everything. They can fight their way almost out of anything. Unless you're dealing with a dwarf specific something, only a dwarf can slay this or only an elf can slay this. A human can do anything an elf can do and a dwarf can do, just I not can do the anything same you. <laughs> yeah. Everybody starts singing the song. No, we're <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's uh, bounce up. To, if, if there's more, uh, we'll have the open uh, section here in, in a, a moment. Uh, let's jump up to Heathen Dog here with the primary question, which is, uh, what are the benefits? Oh God, do, do we have time for this? I'm just wondering. <laughs> what are the benefits of playing human characters compared to demi humans or monsters? Oh God besides everything yeah you're right okay no 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 the 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 main the main benefit of playing a uh a, a human in in an rpg rather than a demi-human race or some kind of monster race is that the the game master is not limited in where we can go or what we can do if you're playing elves and it, the the story requires you to go underground or or to go into some kind of lava pit, you know, Mount Doom nonsense. The elves are gonna freaking struggle. So and dwarves here, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and and it's it's the same same thing for dwarves in the opposite way. You know, you you, you put them in you put them in uh, empty fields or in in redwood forests and stuff. They are going to be like, what the shit? I got all the allergies. <laughs> exactly you know they, they're they, they're going to be freaking out and none of their of their natural advantages work like dark vision in the plains so it's not even dark at night in the plains there's stars it makes everything visible for just as far as your night vision there's no light pollution in in D, &D yet okay well there shouldn't be in D, &D yet so that doesn't even matter and you you put an elf underground, and their their, their little dainty constitution is is immediately going to going to die from black lung. You know that's just how it's going to work. But a human, uh, as it, it, as a game master, putting humans, you can put them anywhere, and it will work. It'll work. They will not be immediately on their back foot. The players will not be immediately on their black foot on the back foot. Excuse me. So that that that's that's the main thing about about humans in your game. For a game master, it makes it easy. You you can you you can open up the settings. Right? And for a player, you will never be hampered dependent on where you are physically in the game world. You can still function at near 100% in any environment. Unlike all those dirty demi humans. <laughs> So I'm asking this one only because there's a word in here that I just love. Okay. Can you share a time when a human character's <clears throat> versatility enhanced yeah. your gameplay experience? Oh, God, yes. I mean, uh, from, from what Timothy was saying earlier, the whole diplomacy thing. And someone in chat... I didn't star it because... The reaction you know, I, I, I got it. The reaction rolls. I think I grabbed that one. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in old D&D, TSR D&D... Humans had a base neutral reaction to all races, which was an amazing advantage. You you have the face of your group as a human. Even if even if there's a bunch of dwarves with you, you have the human smooth it over and you could get into and get out of an elven village alive. Without serious incident. That's what humans do. They they build bridges even if they're temporary between between discordant ideas. 
So for a brief moment, everyone involved can have a moment of clarity. Even if it's short-lived, they still had it and they'll remember it. That's what humans do. That's, that's, that's humans' greatest strength in any world that they're played properly in. A few years ago, I did a video. Uh, it's actually one of the more watched ones on speciesism before, you know, that term became co-opted by the modern crowd. But, but I actually like the term speciesism because it is important to think of these races as different species. And it actually talks a lot about this stuff. I wouldn't say it's the best audio quality. I had some noise gate issues back then, but, um, I think everybody should check that out. Uh, it's on uh, speciesism and I think fantasy role playing games or something like that. But Shameless the reason the reason why I bring that up is because since we have a minute or two left in this topic, uh, there are a couple of games out there, and hopefully we don't touch on this later. That I just wanted to point out that found a way to take the trope, and this is outside of Dungeons and Dragons. That found a way to take the 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 trope of human diversity and and the elven you know longevity you know, all the, all the things that we're used to and and put them in a new way and one of them is a game we all get to drink now because uh, let's just mention Earth Dawn uh, can you describe versatility Heathen Dog yes uh, versatility is an inherent magical trait that only humans can develop which allows them to to use uh magical skills from uh from completely uh different say classes than their own and no one else no one else can do that because because the human mind is changeable it's malleable you can you can force yourself to think in a different way but compartmentalize that so it doesn't bleed through the to the rest of your life for example if you are a fighter a human fighter can learn to cast spells. Normally, it would take not only years of training, but a specific mindset to wield magical energy effectively. A human has the ability to take that, mold it to something that works for them, and get the same result. You can which, be dual which, class or multi class without actually being dual class yes, or multi class. Yes. And that that that's and that's thank you very much. That's actually a, a good point. I didn't I didn't push in. Is that you are not dual class at this point. You are still a straight up pure fighter, but you are also able to do this other thing, maybe not as well as a straight up wizard, but just as effectively as a straight up wizard because yeah, you are a, human. A, a true wizard will still kick your butt oh yeah because yeah, yeah. Fine, because fine, he has yeah, those fine. other wizardly things behind him but what kind of surprise is it when all of a sudden you throw out a spell at somebody <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it, it is a it is a great trick to have in your pocket and it is it is also as a player it is a great way to uh to make yourself different than mm -hmm. other humans to to to, to you know to play your the personality of your character leans not just a fighter but also respects and now understands magic and so that's what that's what makes you different than everybody else fine dude great. claw shape as a fighter claw shape sure is, i don't get karma great. behind it Who cares? Guy, we're, we're too specific in earth on but yes but people can get the visual of it you can take yes. the idea from the beast master and actually change your hands into uh, into bestial form and you don't need a weapon not no. that you did anyway you already had good you yeah, know combat weapon, right? yeah. yeah i mean uh the to to a non-human that is absolutely ridiculous to a non-human it's unheard of and unfathomable that you can use a class power of a class that you are not part of inconceivable but hey that that's what humans do that's it's a it's a great way of denoting human versatility, which is our strength, our our diversity, our adaptability. And now let's talk about the word adaptability. Let's pull out one more game, Forbidden Lands. Forbidden Lands does this as well. Now, how does Forbidden Lands do it? If you feel that somehow you can use a different skill to get something done, basically BS the GM. Yeah. You can do that. If you can somehow explain, or I'm sorry, it's attribute, not skill. If you can so somehow explain how your wits will get you to attack something better, 
and do it in a logical or in, in a reasonable manner, you can spend a will PowerPoint. And now you've actually utilized a different, uh, oh, let's use something a little more poignant, dexterity. Because because melee weapons, if I remember correctly, are strength. Okay, so you're clubbing them with strength. If I'm wrong about this, the idea is still the same. Everybody else has to use strength. But you know what? You want to use a little finesse and your strength's been hurt. You, it's dropped a little bit. And your dexterity or agility is higher. If you can finagle the GM and say, you know what? I'm going to do a nice little, pure, uh, uh, oh, it's not pirouette. Um, I forget the term, but, uh, you know, and, and lunge in. You know what? Yeah, I think that that works for agility. Now you're using your agility attribute. Nobody else can do that. Dwarves are stubborn. They don't know when they're supposed to lose and die. So what do they get? They get the ability to push the roll. So if you fail something, you can push a roll to basically use an extra oomph and if you still fail you're like no 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 i'm a dwarf i'm too stubborn to lose and you can do it again nobody else can do that it goes across with, with all the different races where it maintains the tropes where humans are diverse humans are versatile humans are adaptable the other ones have lean into the stubbornness lean into the age for the elves are effectively immortal yada yada i'm not going to go into all of them but you get the idea and that is the proper way to handle uh, humans and demi humans, if you don't want to just copy the DD tropes. Okay. All right, I think we are actually done with that. So uh, we'll look at some chat here in a moment. But uh, now that's actually what we're going to lean into in the next segment is going to be starting the crafting gamer. We are going to talk about navigating demi human tropes. But let's see what we start here for some chat. First Mage's Musings, yep, he says in AD&D First Edition, humans had a neutral default reaction adjustment when parlaying with other races, which is a massive advantage that often gets ignored. Yeah, because a lot of people don't use reaction rolls. But uh, yeah, if I remember correctly, and somebody can fact check me on this one, Second Edition AD&D, all races had a, a, a charisma, maximum charisma of 12 with other races. I can't remember if humans were... Uh, uh, we're, we're different in that regard or not. But the point is, is that that affects those reaction rules. So you're already starting off negative if you're an elf talking to a dwarf. And then you don't have a great charisma. Double Aegis Musing also says, all dummy humans are just humans with funny hats. Some internet person, probably. That's the way they treat them. Well, yeah. they're intelligent. Why can't they do the same thing humans do? Biosensualism, that's why. Literally, they First evolve. Is, they they want to keep... Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The worst part about it is they want to keep the different powers. Well, at that point, play a superhero game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, d dolphins are supposed to be smarter than dogs, but for damn it, they can't walk. <laughs> why Why can't dolphins walk? <laughs> and the answer is, dude, stop being stupid. That That's right. the answer for this, too. Demi-humans are just humans with funny hats. Stop being stupid. Please. And then the last one was, Lodic says, uh, there's short lifespan. And this is something a lot of people forget. I've used this uh, argument quite a few times, especially when compared to elves and dwarves. This is about humans. The short lifespans and high reproductive rate gives them motivation to struggle against adversity that other races don't have. They can't afford to wait a problem out. We are considered zealots. We are considered, as, as he said before, we're considered chaotic. We're considered prolific. All those terms are right in that, that, there we go, that comment down there. That, our advantage is all of that. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a disadvantage as well. And in, in, a, in a lot of games, the, 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 the races that have the, the, the shortest lifespan have the most explosive um, societies. Like, uh, yeah. there, there are many examples of orcs and ogres going through massive booms and busts in their society where they have, they, they, they only live to like what 40, you know? Yeah. But they're also not 30, diverse 40, though. Like, a lot of games. When so might what, makes right what, constantly. What? Well, so, so orcs and ogres aren't diverse either. So all they only live by might makes right. Well, I know, I know, but be, because they have a short lifespan they constantly expand, 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 and then all the other races are like, no, beat them back. And then they just expand, expand, expand again because they need to get shit done. Yeah. They don't have time. And humans don't do it as inherently violently, but we are, we are uh, forced to make our mark quickly and indelibly 
because we're only going to live between 60, 70, and 100 years. Whereas the elves are going to live five, six, seven, a thousand or forever. And the, the dwarves are going to live two, three, four hundred. Even, even the freaking half, uh, halflings live like 120, 150. Some I, 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 thought, I thought they were the same as human, but maybe they're not. I, I don't I, remember. I think they live a little, a little longer. But uh, so, so humans are driven to make their mark because they don't have time compared to many of the demi human races. They just don't have the time. They have to move now. So and part so of what you're saying right there is exactly why only humans can be paladins. Yes. Yeah. No other race can actually be that zealous. No other race can feel that strongly and not be crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what is a what is a dark elf? I know we're going to get into demo humans in a moment here, but what is a dark a, elf? An insane uh, a, a a a dark elf is a lot of times an insane elf. Well, it's it's an elf that's been kicked out of elven society. You're not conforming. Yeah. You are out of dark. Uh, exactly. And to an elf, that's horrific. Yeah, it's insane. Yes, to to a to a normal elf, a dark elf is someone who who is is suffering from many many mental disorders. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about that in the next segment. So, in the meantime, here, if you enjoy this discussion, please like this video, subscribe to all of the panelists' channels, which you can find in the description. That's right. Double subscribe, double like. Wait a minute. Wouldn't Woo. that be on and then off again? Dang it! Because you know, heathen dogs here, and you're gonna have to like me and him. That you know what? Just like one of us. <laughs> no, no, no. Like like me, like him, then like us both. We'll oh, there fine. you go. There you go. Aw. Am I human tropes?